Whether you're a coffee connoisseur or just someone who likes expensive milkshakes for grown-ups, there's only one coffee shop that can be counted on to serve up the good stuff just about everywhere. Starbucks. Starbies! I got Starbies! But how did this Pike Place Market coffee bean store turn into a 35,000 location global empire in just 50 odd years? And what the heck is a Starbucks anyway? Today, we're brewing up the eye-popping history of Starbucks. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel. And let us know in the comments below what other iconic chains you would like to hear about. Okay, time to double up on those espresso shots. Back in the 1960s, San Francisco, Dutch immigrant Alfred Piet, the founder of Piet's Coffee and Tea, taught a soon-to-be-famous trio the ins and outs of roasting coffee. And with his blessing, Jerry Baldwin, Gordon Bowker, and Zev Siegel took their newfound knowledge up to Seattle, where they sought to open up a coffee store all their own. Okay, so maybe the trio isn't as famous as the brand they created, which was called... Uh, they were still trying to figure that out, actually. They knew they wanted it to reflect both the culture of the Northwest and the seafaring coffee traders who first brought coffee to the United States. So they tossed around a few ideas. At first, Baldwin wanted to go with either Cargo House or the name of the main ship in Moby Dick, Pequod. The Pequod probably would have fared a lot better if it had gone with coffee instead of whaling. But otherwise, it's difficult to see the connection. After being told by artist Terry Heckler that this was a terrible idea, the trio began looking around the region for a new name that stuck out. And in the Cascade Mountains, they found just the thing, an abandoned copper mine called Starbo. You hear a name like that, and you just know that mine is loaded with coffee. But since Baldwin was still inexplicably hell-bent on his Moby Dick idea, Starbo's would not do. Instead, he offered up Starbuck, the name of the Pequod's first mate. They all agreed to it. They added an S to the end to make it roll off the tongue better, and they had Terry Heckler draw up the logo design that the company still uses to this day. A twin-tailed mermaid, meant to look like the mythological siren. Okay, so their picks were a famously doomed first mate, and a creature that lures sailors to their demise. Let us fly these deadly waters, let us home. Yeah, that sounds like my neighborhood Starbucks. And I know that sometimes I'd be in one Starbucks, and then you'd be in the other Starbucks. In 1971, the first ever Starbucks opened up in Pike Place Market, overlooking Seattle's Elliott Bay. Initially, Starbucks was not the sit-down cafe it is today. Instead, it was a store that sold a variety of fine coffee beans, freshly roasted in-house, along with an assortment of coffee-making equipment. It would be another 10 years before they brewed their first coffee. Even so, over the course of that first decade, the company found success, and they managed to open up another four whole locations by 1982. In 1980, Zev Siegel left Starbucks to pursue other dreams, and a young, enterprising New York businessman named Howard Schultz stepped in to take his place. Prior to joining Starbucks, Schultz was a sales rep for Hammarplast, a Swedish kitchen equipment company. With a name like that, what else could it have been? In the course of his sales rep duties, he noticed that a small chain of coffee stores up in Seattle was one of Hammerplast's biggest customers. So he decided to check out the company for himself and see what they were up to. He took a trip, and it was love at first sight. Within the year, Jerry Baldwin and Gordon Bowker brought Schultz on as their new head of marketing. At first, this meant Schultz spent his time printing out brochures and familiarizing confused customers with the many types of imported coffee beans. But after a fateful trip to Milan in 1983, Schultz came back to America with big ideas. What if, rather than simply slinging mere coffee beans, Starbucks stores turned themselves into European-style sit-down cafes? Sit-down coffee shops were relatively rare in the U.S. at that time. Americans weren't really into sitting down in 1983, unless they were about to eat a steak or watch Superman 3. Sit-down coffee shops would be an entirely new experience. Schultz thought if they franchised this idea before anyone else, they could run a network of cafes across the entire country, before any potential competitors knew what hit them. But Baldwin and Bowker weren't crazy about the idea. They wanted to keep Starbucks local and true to its coffee origins. 
For them, adding cappuccinos and lattes to the mix would go against their core business model. Plus, with an expanding menu, Baldwin would quickly run out of Moby Dick characters to name things after. A rift broke open between the two founders and Schultz, and Schultz left Starbucks in 1985, going on to start his very own Milan-inspired coffee shop called Il Giornale. His new shop was a hit, and he was quickly able to grow it across several different cities. But when Jerry and Gordon put Starbucks up for sale in March of 1987, Schultz saw his chance to take another shot at what he really wanted. And with some investor backing, he purchased the then 20-store Starbucks chain for himself for $3.8 million. Who among us hasn't bought themselves a $4 million treat? He then rebranded all of his Il Giornale locations under the Starbucks name, and by the early 90s, he'd grown the company to 100 different locations across the U.S. By the end of the 90s, though, that number would boom to 2,500 after the company went public in 1992, making Starbucks the largest chain of coffee shops in the world before Y2K ever got the chance to bring it all crumbling down. Over the course of the 90s, under Schultz's leadership, Starbucks saw some of its biggest brand-defining changes. In 1991, for instance, the chain introduced three different sizes, tall, grande, and venti, confusing customers for decades to come. Tall is large, and grande is Spanish for large. Venti's the only one that doesn't mean large. It's also the only one that's Italian. Congratulations, you're stupid in three languages. And in 1994, they introduced their first ever drive throughs which would eventually make up over half of its revenue stream. Honestly, whatever puts the least amount of steps between you and the coffee. If Starbucks unveiled a deliver straight to your bedroom option, you know you would sign up immediately. 1995 saw Starbucks' invention of the Frappuccino, an iced take on the classic cappuccino, while 1996 saw the company's first ever international locations open up in Japan and Singapore. Things stayed steady for a time, and Schultz switched over from CEO to executive chairman in the year 2000. And three years after that, Starbucks unveiled its wildest creation yet, the pumpkin spice latte. Ugg wearers the world over rejoiced. Growth continued on, and in 2005, Starbucks opened its 10,000th location. If you've been keeping track, that's 100 times the number of locations they had just 15 years prior. So if you're one of those people who feel like Starbucks came out of nowhere and blew up overnight, you're not exactly wrong. What's more, between the years 2000 and 2007, Starbucks was opening almost five new locations around the globe every single day, peaking with 2,500 new locations in 2007 alone. Not even rabbits multiply that fast. Well, maybe if they were jacked up on coffee. But even though Schultz had made good on his idea to corner the coffee shop market before any competitors had a chance to react, they now had plenty of time to catch up. And with the expansion of Dunkin' Donuts and the McCafe menu at McDonald's, Starbucks started to have some real competition. When the Great Recession hit in 2007, the seemingly unstoppable Starbucks brand crashed back down to earth losing 42% of its stock price along the way, causing Schultz to step back in as CEO. He cut through Starbucks like a rampaging whale, shutting down almost 1,000 underperforming stores, laying off nearly 7,000 baristas, and presumably wrestling Ronald McDonald in a cage. Schultz also had automatic espresso machines removed from the stores and shut down every single U.S. location for one dark afternoon and made all 135,000 remaining baristas retrain in the art of espresso making for a return to a more hands-on barista experience. It may seem harsh or extreme, like a unicorn frappuccino. Oh. I wish I was dead. But it worked. In under two years, Schultz was able to turn things around, and both sales and the company's stock rebounded by 2009, to bigger and better heights than ever before. What's more, the company launched its rewards program that very same year, making it one of the first major corporations to take advantage of the growing smartphone phenomenon. Hey, they know a thing or two about addiction. Starbucks beans are roasted very dark, even darker than French roast, creating coffee with bitterness and a hint of charred wood. Bitter burnt sticks is typically a flavor profile to avoid, but is considered tasty for coffee. In its early days, this roast helped Starbucks stand out from weaker American brews. But as the company expanded, it also needed a uniform flavor to serve in locations across the world. The dark roast came to the rescue again by helping to mask bean differences while improving brewing efficiency through higher temperature processing. 
but you don't get to the top of any field without earning your fair share of haters. As such, many coffee snobs started to take swipes at Starbucks' signature flavor. If this is anybody's normal coffee order, how do you do it? I don't understand. Their coffee had been called burnt by many. Hey, we did say a hint of charred wood. And it has landed in the company of a couple derogatory nicknames, including Starburnt and Charbucks. One coffee brand, Black Bear Micro Roastery, even launched their own Charbucks line of dark roasted coffee, a product that got them entangled in 14 years worth of lawsuits from Starbucks itself. You mad, Starbo? Black Bear won out in the end, and many of the coffee bean sellers now sell their very own varieties of Charbucks coffee to this day. More recently, Starbucks has also gotten itself into hot water with its treatment of unionizing workers, amassing over 325 charges concerning unfair labor practices. While Schultz has maintained that the company has a different and better vision for operating than these budding unions, the unions have argued for higher wages and more convenient working hours. Initially, these unions also argued that Starbucks employees, too, should be able to cash in on America's ever-growing tip economy, since baristas working for smaller businesses are often able to take advantage of those 18% surcharges on every order. Schultz gave in to this latter demand and then moved to counter the unions by raising wages and providing workers with health care options and free college tuition, but only in the 97% of locations that had yet to unionize. Locations that had already unionized would have to negotiate new terms of employment on an individual basis. As Starbucks has offered these increased benefits, calls for unionization have cooled. Talk about Starburnt. Over the course of Starbucks history, many fan-favorite drinks have come and gone. The Valencia Orange Refresher, the Dark Barrel Latte, the Cherry's Jubilee Mocha, and the luxurious Chantico which was basically like drinking a mug of chocolate chips. Honestly, you can take everything else off the menu at that point. Then there are all the promotional drinks, like the zombie frappuccino and that unicorn blood chalice we mentioned earlier. While all of these beloved beverages are sorely missed, perhaps no short-lived Starbucks product line is quite as revered as Tivana. In 2012, Starbucks purchased the then 15-year-old tea house chain for $620 million. But less than five years later, Starbucks announced that they would be closing down all of Tivana's locations. While some of Tivana's products continue to be sold by Starbucks today, every last Tivana tea house was shuttered by 2018. Today, Starbucks has over 35,000 locations in over 80 different countries, but a select few locations, less than 30, are marked with the prestigious title of Starbucks Reserve, which sounds like something that comes in a 40-ounce bottle, but is much more expensive. At these specialty coffee bars, customers can get what Starbucks believes to be their finest coffee ever, often sourced from a single origin. Through Starbucks Reserve, Schultz finally brought his brand of coffee house back to the city that inspired the entire idea, Milan, the location of Italy's first ever Starbucks. This 25,000 square foot facility opened in 2018 and occupies the Palazzo Brogi which was once the city's stock exchange. It has a coffee bar, a wood-fired bakery, a store, and a cocktail bar that serves up Italian favorites, such as Aperol and Campari Spritz. But you don't have to go all the way to Italy to sample Starbucks Reserve. The upscale brand now has locations in, among other places, New York City, Atlanta, Chicago, Palm Springs, and Honolulu. So, for those looking to throw on a tuxedo and sip a pumpkin spice martini, a prestige coffee experience could be just around the corner. If you look crisp enough, they may even let you order a Chantico. So what do you think? How do you feel about Starbucks? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other Weird History Food videos.